Borderlands 3 came out about a week ago, and it appears to be a rip-roaring success. Borderlands 3 has twice as many players as its predecessor, despite some performance issues and epic exclusivity. Yeah, just a few bugs, a launcher nobody likes, but no big deal, right? I mean, according to Randy Pitchford, Gearbox's CEO, the launch day peak concurrent players of Borderlands 3 is about twice as high as the all-time peak concurrent players of Borderlands 2. That is quite impressive. So what's with my doom and gloom title, The Collapse of Gearbox? Well, first, I would like to talk about the other part of the title, the Indefensible bit. Indefensible began as a series on indie game devs and their corruption back during Gamergate's relevance period. At this point, though, I'm just going to use this series as a way to discuss corruption, cultural Marxism, and general culture war BS in all of gaming, because Gamergate just isn't relevant anymore, and SFO is not primarily a gaming news channel. So I figured I'd just put all the gaming stuff under one tag, okay? Let's begin with what is, unfortunately, probably not true, although I wish it were. And I think there are some portions that might be. This post started floating around shortly after the Epic Game Store exclusivity deal for Borderlands 3 went public. I've messaged what I'm about to say to several YouTubers as protest for the Epic Games exclusive deal, so now I'm telling you all here in case they twist what I said. Randy Pitchford is on Twitter right now taking the high ground as if he had nothing to do with it. Our publisher had no interest in Epic exclusive until Randy pushed it and convinced them to do it all because he wants a bigger bonus that he didn't earn. He screams and yells at us over the smallest thing. He's a big bully almost, and you can see that if you watch the press conference with how nervous the others look next to him. Well, here's that press conference, and Randy does look all sunshine and rainbows, but oh boy, that is a crowd of unhappy people behind him. They look like they know if they say one wrong thing, make one wrong move, their ass is grass. Borderlands 3, by Randy's choice, is pushing online multiplayer hardcore over the story. We legitimately have our 15-hour campaign done and ready to go, but are forced to make at least 50 hours of online stuff for launch. Everything you loved about Borderlands 1 and 2 is non-existent in 3. As a side note, people are generally saying that the writing has gone downhill tremendously between Borderlands 2 and 3, especially with the characterization of the game's main villains as religious cult leaders, and the heroes playing some kind of edgy atheist pluses. I guess Randy played Far Cry 5 or Iconoclasts, and thought that's what Borderlands 3 should be. At the same time, those villainous twins are also live streamers, and their broadcasts throughout the game are half Twitch stream, half sermon. And I'm not an idiot, the commentary is clear. Old media's always hated new media, and as a subfeud of that, game developers have always hated YouTubers and streamers, because generally, unlike games journalists, we're not as corrupt. You'd be hard-pressed to find a YouTuber willing to be bought to make a fake review for a game, and when those few YouTubers have done it, it almost always comes out, and their audience almost always drags them for it. If you've got pent-up disdain for somebody for being both more popular than you, as well as not answering to your power structure, Borderlands 3 is generally the story you'd write. Also, it's quite the feat that the writing's worse than Borderlands 2, considering that Borderlands 2's writing was absolutely abominable. Don't tell Angry Joe that, though. Yes, this is a real screen cap from his Borderlands 2 video. Let's get back to it, though. After the Epic exclusive was confirmed inside the studio, we were told we were not allowed to talk about the issues of the platform on our personal Twitters or anything. I decided to try and confirm this. Here is a list of the Twitter accounts of Gearbox employees. This list obviously isn't exhaustive, as Gearbox has hundreds of employees working for them, but these are the people who listed their position at Gearbox in their bio all of whom can be confirmed by both LinkedIn accounts as well as their names appearing in the credits of various Gearbox games. Almost none of them have mentioned Epic Games on Twitter, and the few that have do so in a universally positive light. Of course, this doesn't necessarily prove that they're banned from talking negatively about Epic, only that they haven't done so. It's entirely possible that they all actually like Epic on their own. It's also entirely possible that Gearbox company policy is that you're just not allowed to talk about anything controversial at all. Unless it's Donald Trump, anyway. A good chunk of the accounts I looked at had their share of Orange Man bad tweets, so maybe the rule only swings one way. But here's why I think this is probably a fake, at least somewhat. As Rebellion, we've stolen a build of the game and will upload to the Pirate Bay if our demands are not met in four weeks. We want no Epic exclusive. We want better working conditions. We want 40-hour work weeks. We want Randy Pitchford to take anger management classes. And we want to be Gearbox 2009 again. As far as I can tell, the game never did get uploaded to the Pirate Bay, at least not within this time frame. And I'm pretty sure none of the demands ever got met. However, it is possible that this post was written by a disgruntled Gearbox employee, because a lot of other things about it do line up. For example, Randy Pishford did indeed take to Twitter to give the Epic Games Store a very public blowjob. 
My expectation is that Epic's investment in technology will outpace Valve substantially. When we look back at Steam in 5 or 10 years, it may look like a dying store and other, more competitive stores will be the place to be. The competitive store that happens to be the leader in 10 years may not be Epic's store, but it probably won't be Valve's. And Epic's moves right now are opening the door and paving the way for a vibrant, competitive economy. Epic is the forcing function that is going to make all this happen. It's really incredible, but they are the only guys who can really come along to disrupt Steam's monopoly and help all this get fixed. They will bring balance to the force. There has been an intense hatred of Valve and Steam on the social justice side of game development for a while now. As soon as Steam allowed anyone to publish their game, regardless of content, as long as it wasn't a virus or something, game journalists lost their mind at the idea that a major tech company was not going to censor its users or products on their behalf. Valve, the owner of Steam, is also not publicly traded, so Chinese state corporations like Tencent can't buy their way into Steam's pockets the way they did with the Epic Game Store. Steam also refuses to implement service-wide algorithms to make curated content bubble to the surface of everyone's feeds, another quality that SJWs find objectionable because they're so used to the false inflation that services like YouTube and Facebook give them. Instead, Steam displays items that are on sale prominently and gives you a generated list of games it thinks you may like based on the games you've recently played which, unlike YouTube or Facebook's algorithms, can actually be disabled. That's the extent that Steam pushes content onto its users, and today's techie authoritarians find this unacceptable. So unacceptable that they'd rather jump into bed with the Epic Game Store and all of its huge flaws. In this larger game, Randy Pitchford is the fall man, the sap who has to explain his company's selling out to his own install base. I think I have a slightly different view on monopolies than, than most people. Yes, competition can be good for a marketplace, but is competition making the streaming service industry any better? Or is Netflix in the shitter and people are just pirating everything? The one market state better for the consumer than rigorous competition is a monopoly where the monopolizer still respects its audience and still manages to innovate. This almost never happens because human beings are pretty shitty, but it did happen with Steam. The meme of the kingly, godlike Gabe Newell is, in part, a recognition that the stars actually did align with Valve, and the Epic Store is hated because their disruption means ruining a good thing. But our boy Randy doesn't really understand this. He thinks it's all just gamers being crybabies or something. Bitch and moan all you want, digital stores and PC are being unmonopolized. What a galaxy-brained take. Unmonopolize digital stores and PC by giving one digital store on PC a monopoly on your game in exchange for a fat check. Wouldn't unmonopolization mean putting it everywhere all at once, Randy? Naturally, gamers weren't happy about this turn of events. And naturally, the powers that be determined that the problem was the gamers and not Gearbox. When average people have no way to protest, they turn to things like review bombing. The recent escapades of sites like Rotten Tomatoes have shown us that the powers that be don't like it when we object to their behavior in this manner. So now negative reviews have simply become illegitimate. You automatically lose all credibility for your argument when you stoop to this level, purposely trying to tank reviews of previous installments just because you don't like the decision made for the new release is absurd. This is mob mentality, not feedback. I don't know, fuck epic seems to be pretty straightforward feedback to me. But here's our guy Randy again. Ironically that this misuse is possible and that Steam has no interest in correcting the issue makes me kind of happy about 2K's decision and makes me want to reconsider Gearbox Publishing's current posture on the platform. Unfortunately for you, this isn't misuse. This is protest. You find it to be misuse because you are the target of the protest, Randy. The privileged always feel like they're being oppressed whenever other people tell them that they're wrong. And of course, game journalists moved in lockstep with the rest of the establishment against gamers and with the bizarrely pro-social justice, pro-socialism large corporations, as I'm sure we've all expected them to do since 2014. Confused Borderlands 3 players complain about game in wrong forum. That's quite the headline about this situation. LOL, aren't gamers idiots? They can't get the form right. Oh, oh no. Everyone knew exactly where it was they were posting. The point is that they had nowhere else to post their criticism. But admitting that would mean that you have to accept that Gearbox and Epic are in the wrong. And you're not about to do that, are you? Uh-oh, an 85 meta score on Metacritic with only a 3.8 user score. Is Metacritic the problem too, Randy? Let's read these reviews. What a disaster. Rushed. Runs poor on a 2080 Ti. Humor is the worst. Epic Store, Microtransactions, Social Justice Warriors, It Pronouns, Not They, Looks Like Shit for a 2019 Game, De Nuvo, SJWs, Hello to the Banned People Because of They, Epic Exclusive, Okay, okay, uh, what is this They stuff people are on about? 
Intentionally misgendering a character could get you banned from Borderlands 3. The character Flack uses they, them pronouns. Oh, fuck. Respect the pronouns, you bigot. A moderator of the Borderlands 3 forum wrote in a post on August 12th that the character Flack was written by a non-binary person, and the company's asking forum posters to respect the creator's wish that Flack be referred to with they slash them pronouns. Honest mistakes will not result in a ban, the moderator said, but intentional misgendering of the character will have consequences. Here's the take of a voice actor from Borderlands 3. Flack uses they them pronouns. Flack uses they them pronouns. Flack uses they them pronouns. Flack uses they them pronouns, etc. Stop pushing your own ignorance and anxiety on LGBTQ game devs and gamers. Smooch. Ah. I imagine it's legit difficult for playing what could be your first game without two plus options for strictly male characters. That can be legit scary. But you aren't being erased, I swear. Everyone has a place in this world. We just want to give options to those who've never had them. And, it, and if, after that, you still find yourself spitting mad, fuck you, it's 100% canon. This really is how this type of thing goes every time, isn't it? It's heaps of condescension with a thin layer of, we just want to give people options on top. It's like they know they're taking a shit all over everything. They're like that bratty kid who cried to the teacher all the time, but when you're getting the old talking to, they've stopped the fake tears and they're laughing silently behind their back. So let me get this straight. Flack is a robotic character who doesn't have a gender, but people have been using it to refer to them. And, well, the character's creator, who is a non-binary person, is just not very happy about that. Yep, this obviously non-binary individual, Benjamin Gentleman, who was Flack and Moses' design daddy, there's just, there's nothing gendered about this person at all, is there? Hello, this is fucking epic. You misgender, you get sniped, as it fucking should be. Respect trans NB people or perish. It's simple. It's simple, guys. Accept Benjamin as the proud NB he was always meant to be, or a Gearbox hit squad will straight up fucking murder you. Oh, did you think I was joking about the whole Gearbox hit squad thing? No, they exist. Really. A YouTuber by the name of Sup Matto, whose channel revolved around Borderlands content for years, who was a massive Borderlands superfan, who was one of those guys that would rewatch trailers of Borderlands 3 like 50 times to find little tidbits of info in the background or hidden codes that might mean something since that's how Gearbox loves to run its marketing campaigns. This dude found a Twitch channel hidden in Borderlands 3 promotional material used by the Gearbox developers to test out parts of Borderlands 3's integrations. Submato used the content on this Twitch channel to make Borderlands 3 videos. And guess what happened to him? On April 29th, the official Borderlands YouTube channel posted the reveal of the Twitch extension leading into the gameplay reveal, which we were all stoked about. And the name of the testing accounts were exposed in that video, as we've now learned. This wasn't found by me. It was also posted on various platforms like Reddit and other social medias. That's how it was brought to my attention. So quite a few of us decided to follow these accounts because... Well, simply put, we could. Again, this was all very public and it was shown to about 185,000 viewers at this point. And the channel name appears at 052 on the video when they demonstrated the super cool integrations that they've been working on where we can you know, basically become bosses or do the moxie mixer stuff, or in this case, actually win gear watching our favorite streamers. So this actual Twitch account was linked to all of the other Twitch accounts. They all just had names where it looked like somebody ran their hand across the keyboard. We didn't know if it was coded messages like previous stuff or if it was random. I, again, had it brought to my attention elsewhere and it was exciting. It was absolutely exciting and that's why we decided to check it out. I'll say straight up that it was something we forgot about, but notifications on the Twitch platform tips or tipped us off on it. On Thursday, July 25th, private investigators showed up to my home, trespassed on my private property, and questioned me. I was very tense, as many of you could imagine, having two people in suits you don't know show up to your home. As lawyers, law enforcement, and family have said, I probably shouldn't have spoke to them, but I did because I don't feel I have anything to hide. They questioned me about various things relating to my channel, the live stream that was discussed on my channel, which we will 
we'll get to later, and they told me they were from Take Two Interactive. I later, after researching on LinkedIn, discovered that they were contracted by Take Two and that they have a private firm where they do various things that private investigators would do. We discussed SteamDB, the rainbow rarity, which was found in the code by Kobe, and more. I don't remember it all because, as I said, it was tense and I was definitely uneasy, but I think we spoke for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. After the PIs left within maybe 20 minutes, the Discord server was gone. It was terminated. My account was terminated and that account and server were terminated for, and I quote, being involved in selling, promoting, or distributing cheats, hacked, or cracked accounts. It says nothing about who claimed that this was going on, whether it was Discord or elsewhere. Again, I won't assume who did it. I will say that, of course, I haven't done those things, but I will say that the email also appears to be very automated, so it's probably just a catch-all. The 26th, I received seven copyright strikes, and one of them still stands. I don't know how the others were revoked. I've wondered if YouTube helped or YouTube helped me out or maybe they were retracted. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. I'm not going to assume. Now, according to the YouTube rules, if you receive four strikes in three months, that's it. And the channel is terminated, which I fully expected to happen. And it didn't. As I said, some of the strikes vanished, so the channel stays for now. These strikes were manually placed by 2K CMS, and the only one that remains is set to expire at the end of October. Yeah, Gearbox and 2K Games have absolutely no problem abusing YouTube's copyright system to nuke somebody's account. But even worse than that, they have no problem sending hired thugs to the guy's house to try and intimidate him. Yeah, they, they actually did this. Seriously, they admitted it publicly on The Verge. 2K Games defends necessary actions against YouTuber who shared Borderlands 3 leaks. Necessary actions? Because you were stupid enough to reveal the name of a Twitch account you used to publicly stream Borderlands 3 development, and your most diehard fans were savvy enough to put two and two together? The action we've taken is the result of a 10-month investigation, and a history of this creator profiting from breaking our policies, leaking confidential information about our product, and infringing on our copyrights. How about you go fuck yourself, 2K? Nothing there had the assumption of confidentiality, not after you publicly released the Twitch URL. Everything used there was fair use, and you know it. And most importantly of all, if you've done this whole 10-month investigation and found that Submata was actually infringing, why didn't you file charges and take him to court? Is it because you knew that none of your bullshit would actually stick? So the only thing you could actually do was abuse YouTube DMCA takedowns and send some hired goons over to his place to intimidate him? You have the unmitigated gall to behave this poorly, and you expect people to consider your massive overreach as necessary actions? Fuck you. Take-Two Interactive, the parent company of 2K, has a history of pulling this kind of stunt. For example, when Grand Theft Auto V's modding scene was in full swing, Take-Two sent two PIs to one modder's house in an effort to get him to stop. So I just got a pair of PIs at my door claiming to be sent by Take-Two, handing me a phone with a person somewhere in the UK or US or whatever to discuss how to cease my activities with regard to Grand Theft Auto. That they know what happened before with Activision and want not to get the lawyers involved at this time, however they have tested their legal standing already and are quite certain of their point, and aren't willing to accept any solution other than ceasing my activities. In my opinion, this is how this shitty, sleazy company operates in general, and everyone in the chain, from Take-Two down to 2K all the way down to Gearbox, is some level of responsible for this massive overreach. Well, at this point, Sup Matto's channel is gone. He got hit with seven copyright strikes, as far as I can tell. And although he won a lot of the appeals, he simply decided to leave YouTube. I understand, man. If you're watching this, I hope you come back someday. But even if this event were the only thing I had to talk about in this video, it would be enough for me to never buy Borderlands 3, pirate it if I really wanted to play it, and tell everybody involved in its creation to fuck right off. And no offense to the guy, but I'm not Submato. This video won't be going anywhere. If it goes down, it'll be on my bit shoot. No matter how many muscle-bound Eskimos Randy hires to march up to my snow-covered igloo to give me the business. Get fucked, 2K. But despite the relative success of the Boycott Borderlands 3 hashtag in support of Submato, Borderlands 3's launch has been going well. Well, kinda. In terms of sales, sure. But there's a few strange issues cropping up around the game itself. Where are the cloud saves? On Steam, Lamau. Oh... It's just a switch in the epic launcher, eh? No problem, eh? Stop wanting and turn on the cloud saves, eh? Borderlands 3. PC players report losing their save data. Many users seem to believe the issue lies in the cloud. 
Multiple players on Twitter have reported problems after activating cloud saves that then either wiped progress completely or reset to an earlier save point. One fan tweeted Gearbox and Epic Games asking, I just lost seven hours of work from Borderlands 3 because something went wrong with the cloud save that Epic has. Is there a way to revert it back so I don't lose all the time and all the gear I've got? Yeah, Borderlands 3 deleted my save. Looks like I'll be starting over. I'm guessing this is cloud save related. PSA, do not turn on cloud saves. Maybe that initial question of where are the cloud saves wasn't so much about, hey, does this game have cloud saves and more like, where the hell did my save file go? And here's another question that's probably worth asking. Where the hell did my bandwidth go? Flare2v, a professional streamer, said, after years of playing and streaming Borderlands, I've just found out that I can't stream Borderlands 3. My internet can't stream and also handle whatever of my personal data Borderlands 3 is uploading in the background. And take a look at his usage stats. Holy shit, that is a lot of data being sent out by Borderlands3.exe. I mean, maybe it's all netplay stuff, right? Well, let's talk to the people that cracked Denuvo about what this could possibly be. This guy understandably didn't want to have his name put out there, since he helped bypass one of the most commonly used anti-piracy services. But he has a lot to say about Borderlands 3. The current Denuvo has been recoded from the ground up, and our leaked source code that was used to circumvent Denuvo no longer works. This latest version with Borderlands 3 is basically a virtual machine, but each time you compile the game, it creates a new assembly language for the game, and a new JIT for it too. It makes it hard to crack. People have to spend a bunch of time trying to map out what Denuvo instruction is which x86 instruction. Couple that with the fact that the Borderlands 3 game binaries are usually encrypted, and Denuvo itself unencrypts them on the fly, and now forcing a 10 second 2 mbit limit, where any variation in this shuts off your game as tampering, it's hard. It's VM Protect, but good. By the way, VM Protect is basically a program that will run other programs on an emulated computer with non-standard architecture. Basically meaning that when you run a program, you don't actually run the program. Your computer generates another computer inside of it, which the user, you, have limited access to, and then runs the program on that faked computer. This shit is so intrusive that it would lock up the mouse at random intervals outside of the game due to it checking for unauthorized inputs when I tried injecting. It has to be some kind of key logging spyware in order to do this. That will be super juicy if we can prove that kind of illegal content on keeping pirates out at the expense of possible user data being mined. Our current study of Borderlands 3 shows the only binary that is encrypted is the main EXE. This new version is indeed a stupidly bloated virtual machine. The main EXE is estimated to be 10 times larger than the DRM-free version. The new challenge is how it phones home and gets its encryption keys. It purely depends on your CPU, some sort of hash based off of it. That's why earlier cracks had Intel and AMD specific versions. This one seems to sign a unique key based on your hardware, possibly requiring a different crack for each PC. Shit's fucked until we bypass this and somehow make it universal. Unlikely. Here's the TLDR. Borderlands 3 executable file is 10 times larger than it needs to be. And all of that extra stuff isn't the game. It's an application that emulates a virtual computer which then runs the game. This allows the game to strictly control what your PC does. It records all of your PC's actions and inputs, and then sends that data back to Gearbox, requiring 2 MB per second of your internet bandwidth to do so. And by the way, this is actually illegal, because secretly installing keyloggers onto a PC is a criminal offense. All of this is done to prevent piracy and send all of your computer's behaviors, actions, and data back to Gearbox, 2K, or Epic. This all, this all sounds awful. If there were only some kind of workaround, yeah, I, I know you can pirate it, but, but what if there were something completely legal that we could do? I refunded Borderlands 3 and uninstalled it from the Epic Game Store, but found its install directory and its executable is still there. And I can unfortunately continue to play Borderlands 3 even though it's gone. Talk about sick DRM. Okay, so, so, so the solution is legally buy it, legally refund it, then keep playing it. I mean, it's no different from the tired customer service clerk at Walmart taking a refund but not actually checking to see that you didn't give the product back because they just don't give a shit anymore. The problem's Walmart's, not yours. If the Epic Game Store wants to behave like a sad minimum wage worker in their 60s who has lost all hope for their life, I'm okay with that. But you know, there, there has to be some benefit to playing Borderlands 3 legit. Like having access to all those microtransactions. Wait a minute, I thought Randy Pitchford said there was no microtransactions in Borderlands 3. We will be working on the big campaign DLC and we'll probably also offer additional cosmetics, just as we did with Borderlands 2. What we will not do is free-to-play style microtransactions. No premium currency, no loot boxes, etc. Okay, okay, I get it, Randy. We'll have DLC campaigns for sale, but no microtransact. 2K Games has sent a statement confirming that cosmetic items will be for sale in Borderlands 3. Players will have the option to purchase certain cosmetic items like a character, vehicle, and weapon skins, 
but none of these purchases will be considered pay to win or impacting the gameplay, like weapons or actual gear. Okay, so it's Randy's understanding of what a microtransaction is, not what all of our understanding of what a microtransaction is. I mean, Randy even says this in a Twitter reply to the article. Come on, guys, shitty clickbait headline. Literally seconds before I said that, I made it very clear we're going to do more cosmetic stuff like we did in Borderlands 2. You know I was talking about premium currency and loot boxes kind of stuff not being in the game. You know, there's a fair argument to be made here. Loot boxes are pretty shitty. I don't care if they contain only cosmetic stuff, like an Overwatch, but if rolling the dice is the only way to progress in the game, like with the whole Battlefront 2 controversy, it makes the game unplayable. At the same time, microtransactions don't just refer to loot boxes or other free-to-play models, Randy. A microtransaction is a tiny purchase within a game to get some in-game item. Cosmetic or impactful, direct purchase or loot box, they're all microtransactions. Buying skins or outfits or decals for vehicles, they're all microtransactions too. And people are angry, Randy, because we yearn for a return to where cosmetics were earned by completing side quests or achievements. You know, like in Borderlands 2, where almost all the cosmetics dropped off bosses or were the product of quests? That's what people want games to be again, Randy, and you're part of the problem. So Borderlands 3's launch is a dumpster fire, but the games media hasn't been talking about it too much. Instead, they've been publishing helpful guides on how to write comedy while still being a proper male feminist. Like PC Game Ends, Borderlands 3's sense of humor. Be edgy, be funny, don't be cruel, don't be insensitive. Maybe I sound like an old codger who just doesn't get it, but I don't think you can be edgy without being cruel at least a little bit. Every joke has to have a subject, and being the butt of the joke will always be at least a little uncomfortable. Part of being an adult is learning to laugh at yourself rather than lash out in a screeching fit whenever you're made fun of. If your comedy is any good, you will be at least slightly cruel to somebody. A joke about somebody will be cruel to that somebody. A rape joke will be cruel to the person telling the joke. A pun will be cruel to the audience. Comedy requires that somebody, somewhere and sometime, end up with egg on their face. If SJWs refuse to do this, then it's no wonder that almost all social justice comedy is completely unwatchable. But there's more to Gearbox than Borderlands 3. Like, hey, Battleborn. Battleborn was a game that basically went head-to-head -head with Overwatch and got absolutely fucking annihilated. Nobody played Battleborn. Overwatch had millions of players at its height. According to Steam charts, Battleborn's all-time peak was 12,000 players. It never broke that 1,000 a month average again after its initial launch month, and never made it above 100 again after August of 2017. Gearbox is still paying to keep Battleborn servers running, but the average number of players online at any one time in August of 2019 was just 13.2. The game was meant to support a healthy update cycle like Overwatch, but 14 months after launch, all updates stopped. It was a critical and financial failure for Gearbox. Hey Randy, what was, what was it that made Overwatch popular, dude? Was it the porn? Could it be the Overwatch porn? The millions of porn videos of Overwatch on, on Pornhub? Yeah, okay. J just tweet out that a Battleborn Rule 34 subreddit exists. That'll save the game. Talk about fucking desperate, dude. Also, gamers filled that subreddit up with Overwatch porn just to spite Randy. And I do mean spite him, because at the time of Randy's tweet, the subreddit was pretty new, and the vast majority of content on it was from one user. Did Randy Pitchford create his own Battleborn porn? in a desperate attempt to save his game? I mean, there's no proof of it, but I like to think so. Randy became particularly salty about this once it was discovered. I was about to block you, but then I read your Twitter bio and realized you probably need more love in your life. Thanks. Wow, what the fuck? Attacking somebody personally? That's low, man. You should embrace your failures and laugh at them. You made a crappy game, that's okay. I was being sincere. Also, fuck you for calling our game crappy. We love our game, we love our fans. Randy. What fans? But okay, this is all just fun drama so far. Let's get into the Gearbox fraud. Want to do that? Want to talk about the fraud, the millions of dollars stolen, the, the extreme incompetence? Sega approached Gearbox to make Aliens Colonial Marines. If you haven't played Aliens, it's a steaming pile of shit. It looks like it was barely worked on, and that's because it was. Aliens Colonial Marines. Gearbox stole funds from Sega to make Borderlands 2 and Duke Nukem Forever. An unnamed Sega staffer has revealed that Gearbox Software stole funds from Sega to make Borderlands 2 and Duke Nukem Forever. These funds were actually for Aliens Colonial Marines, but Gearbox betrayed Sega according to the source. Pitchford and Gearbox wanted to focus heavily on Duke Nukem Forever, but how would they get the money to hire some of the 3D Realms team and even buy the intellectual property? Sure, they made a lot from Borderlands, but guess where they got the money to fund Borderlands in the first place? Yep, Sega. So Gearbox essentially lied to Sega, mishandled funds, 
broke agreements and contractual obligations to work on other projects, didn't want to work on a game they were contractually obligated to work on, and gave it to another team. Poor organization and direction on Aliens Colonial Marines. Took on too many projects from different companies at once, and other things we may not even know about. Hell, part of me believes that Gearbox wanted this thing delayed as much as possible so they could get more funding to embezzle from Sega. Sega was looking to sue Gearbox, but since Gearbox shipped the product, they couldn't. So what kind of game did we finally get? Oh. Oh no. Oh, he's just a cute little alien guy, isn't he? Aliens Colonial Marie's was outsourced by Gearbox to another company, Timegate, and some former Timegate employees decided to come forward as well and describe the situation to Eurogamer. Aliens Colonial Marines is heavily regarded as one of the biggest train wrecks in gaming history. Criticisms have run rampant from its shoddy critical reception to gamers crying afoul of its pre-release demo not being at all representative of the final product. It became apparent that Gearbox had ignored the game for years. According to three staffers, Gearbox had focused the vast majority of its efforts on Duke Nukem Forever, Borderlands, and Borderlands 2. There was obviously not four years of work done on the game, said one source. Apparently what Gearbox gave Timegate was merely a collection of assets with little rhyme or reason as to how it was all planned to come together. A lot of assets just didn't seem like they fit there, the source noted. Perhaps the biggest thing Timegate didn't have when it began developing the game was a script. According to three sources, narrative designers at Gearbox and Timegate were constantly writing and rewriting the game, causing the designers to discard entire levels. For a couple months, we were just kind of guessing, said one source. It's really weird to work on a game you don't have a basic idea of how things will work. We were told many times through demo production, don't worry about performance, just make it awesome, said one source. There's a reason those demos were never really playable. The game feels like it was made in nine months, said a source that worked on the project. That's because it was. And if you needed any more proof that Aliens Colonial Marines was a rushed, back-burner mess of a project despite it being Gearbox's only financial lifeline from 2008 to 2013, a simple typo in the code is responsible for the goofy behaviors of the aliens in the game. As a user of ModDB.com discovered, the biggest bug in the game is just one letter long. Inside your game's configuration file is the following line of code. Class remapping equals act underscore attach Xeno to tether, points at pecan game dot pecan sequence act underscore attach pawn to tether. Except it doesn't actually say attach pawn to tether. It says attach pawn to tether. The attach pawn to tether function controls the behavior of the enemies in the game. And when you fix this one typo, the game's enemies actually act like enemies and not puppets. They had coded behavior for the aliens to stalk around the player, coordinate in groups, patrol areas, attack from a flank, all kinds of cool stuff. And none of it worked because they released the game without giving the code a second pass. As for Duke Nukem Forever, nobody expected that game to actually be good. It was in development hell since 1999, and Gearbox picked up the project just to get something out the door. Yeah, yeah, they siphoned money meant to be used for Alien from Sega, but fine, whatever. Duke Nukem Forever really wasn't Gearbox's fault. They did the best they could with what they were given, and now they own the Duke Nukem IP. It seems like they don't really plan to use it, though. New Duke Nukem game is highly unlikely, says Gearbox. Like a washed-up actor, Duke Nukem's future only has cameo appearances instead of starring roles. If you ever wanted to pick a character that modern-day verifieds on Twitter would call the most toxic of them all, Duke Nukem would be that guy. He is the epitome of toxic masculinity. And that's the point. He's an over-the-top caricature. And I've always been fun with laughing at the absurdity of the Duke Nukem games. And despite the previous article, Randy himself said on Twitter, I owe a good part of my early career to the franchise, and I love it. But Duke needs a future. We'll take care of the past, but we need to do so in a way that does not ruin the future. What is that future? I mean, there was a shitty cameo of a neutered Duke in Bulletstorm, but that's about it. I could have sworn there was an interview with Randy Pitchford recently where he said that he was glad that he owned the Duke Nukem franchise because it's pure toxic masculinity, it's harmful to gaming, and as long as he has his way, Duke will never come back. But maybe I just imagined it, because I can't find it anymore. Vice published something similar anyway. How Duke Nukem can be saved for the 21st century. Let's see. But there's something different about this invasion, and it's nothing to do with the aliens themselves. This time, the women that Duke used to objectify are fighting back to. And this is where his road to salvation begins. Duke's still a condescending piece of shit, content to fight beside women in a purely isn't this cute kind of way. But his allies are shown as equals. When he tries it on, he gets shot down. This is an essay on how a future Duke Nukem game should be all about how Duke realizes that he's problematic. Honestly, the worst part is, if Gearbox ever does make a new Duke game, it'll probably be this. So far, the picture painted is pretty clear. 
Randy Pitchford has his pet project, Borderlands, and he's taken on other side projects in order to fund his company while he works on the main thing. That's fair, a lot of people do that. But generally, it's expected that you actually produce your side projects and then use the profit to create your main one, not just take the funding and run, leaving wreckage in your wake. Which makes it all the more surprising that, I think, the initial concept for Borderlands was actually plagiarized. The original version of Borderlands 1 looked a lot like a knockoff of Rage, which itself was an extremely mediocre PlayStation 3 shooter. This video looks nothing like the Borderlands that eventually came out, but it is, in fact, how the game originally looked. And boy, does it look generic. Gearbox knew their game was in trouble, and needed something to make itself stick out. Here's some clips from a short film titled Code Hunters, made by Ben Hibben for MTV back in 2006. Does it remind you of anything? Anything at all? Is it somewhat similar to the opening sequence to the original Borderlands, perhaps? Maybe, maybe some scenes in Borderlands were directly ripped off from Code Hunters? I don't know. In an interview from 2012, Ben Hibben stated that he was contacted by Gearbox prior to the redesign of the game back in 2008. They asked me if I would be interested to direct or design some cutscenes for them. We exchanged a few emails, but the project didn't materialize in the end. I didn't think much of it at the time, until I saw the final game in 2009. I have never created or designed anything for Gearbox or Borderlands. Gearbox saw my work and decided to reproduce it, make it their own, without my help or my consent. The hardest part for me when this happened was understanding why they wouldn't ask me directly. We were already talking about doing some work together. It made no sense. I understand being inspired. I understand giving homage. But when that's the case, you're not generally calling up the guy to offer him a job, cutting him off without warning, and then forging on ahead with your for the time, unique style, while remaining publicly silent and ignoring all questions about it. In my opinion, if you're acting this way, you're probably not inspired. You're probably embarrassed that you blatantly rip somebody off who's more talented than you are. Okay, uh, is, is this everything? Is that all you've got up that magician's sleeve of yours, Randy? We've got the plagiarism, the misuse of funds, the incompetence, the illegal data harvesting, the browbeating of your critics, the constant scum bucket moves. I think that's all the sins of Gearbox, right? I mean, there couldn't be anything else, could there? How much worse could it get? Plaintiff Wade Callender, in his individual capacity and on behalf of The Hatch LLC, files this original petition against Randall Pitchford II and Gearbox Software. Randy Pitchford is a manipulative and morally bankrupt CEO who shamefully exploited his oldest friend, a Texas attorney and military veteran named Wade Callender. It was Randy himself who breached his duties by exploiting Gearbox employees and property to fund Pitchford's private cravings. For example, while Randy was denying employee raises predicated on low cash reserves, Randy secretly saddled Gearbox employees with the burden of repaying a private, personal $12 million bonus that Randy Pitchford rerouted from Gearbox's publisher directly to Randy's side entity, Pitchford Entertainment Media and Magic. Gearbox was contacted in 2014 by someone who discovered a USB drive at a Medieval Times restaurant in Dallas County, Texas. Because the USB drive contained sensitive Gearbox corporate material, the Good Samaritan rightly suspected that the USB drive belonged to a high-level Gearbox employee. Upon hearing of the discovery of this drive, Pitchford declared the drive was his and requested a prompt return. While the drive was being recovered in Texas, Pitchford and Callender were in San Francisco, mediating yet another case in which Pitchford's conduct was front and center. The alien Colonial Marines case. Pending his return to Texas, Callender instructed Gearbox personnel in Texas to make a copy of the USB drive to ensure that its contents could be verified, and if necessary, acted upon. Before Callender could review the USB drive's contents, Pitchford intervened, by retrieving the lost USB drive himself and ordering Gearbox personnel to destroy the copy that Calendar requested. On information and belief, Randy Pitchford's USB drive contained much more than the sensitive documents of Gearbox and its business partners like Take-Two Interactive, 2K Games, Sega, Microsoft, Sony, and etc. Upon information and belief, Randy Pitchford's USB drive also contained Randy Pitchford's personal collection of underage pornography. On information and belief, Pitchford's USB drive experience wasn't enough to deter Randy Pitchford's mischief, as Pitchford subsequently siphoned Gearbox profits to fund parties thrown by Pitchford and his wife at their home for their own personal benefit. At these events, which Pitchford and his wife affectionately term 
peacock parties, adult men have reportedly exposed themselves to minors to the amusement of Randy Pitchford. In November of 2016, Pitchford informed Calendar that he had reached a side deal with Take-Two and 2K Games. The deal, which Pitchford insisted upon concealing, afforded Randy Pitchford a personal, secretive executive bonus of $12 million. Because Pitchford agreed to have his private bonuses counted as advances upon the royalties owed to Gearbox employees, those employees and their families won't receive any of their profit shares until their work repays Randy's bonus to take two. Holy shit. And here's a cryptic tweet from a former Gearbox vice president and voice of the Borderlands character Claptrap, no longer under Randy's thumb, posted shortly after the lawsuit was filed. Yes, it's true. On the December 22nd episode of the podcast The Piff Pod, Randy Pitchford appears to partially validate Wade Callender's story. He spends a good chunk of the time talking about how he likes to watch pornography labeled barely legal, and how he was particularly mesmerized by a cam girl who once squirted live for him, stating that she's a fucking magician. Apparently, Pitchford's interest in her was because, I guess, getting a woman off is a magic trick in his eyes? Yeesh. I know Randy's a magician, but apparently not so much in bed. The podcast's description states, Be warned, this podcast is not for the faint-hearted, as Randy gushes about his love of magic, or something like that. Yeah, they knew what was up. So, some people are saying child porn. Randy's saying barely legal porn, but no one's talking about those peacock parties. Claptrap's voice actor said it was true, but he's also got some other things to say. I was fine with moving on after Gearbox, but when my former boss starts mouthing off about various aspects of my employment, including how highly compensated I was and how generous he is, I feel obligated to correct the record. I had a lot of mixed feelings when asked to reprise the role of Claptrap, but I put our differences aside and did something cool for Borderlands fans. I offered to do it for free, in exchange for past royalties owed, plus an apology for something I've never spoken about before. Randy physically assaulted me in the lobby of the Marriott Marquis at GDC 2017. I think Randy's been on tilt for the last few years. He's not the victim he portrays himself to be. I blocked him a couple years ago for stalking. As an aside, it seems a bit conspicuous that he chimed in on my salary, but didn't mention anything about the $12 million he siphoned from the employee royalty pool. Eddings later elaborated on the event. He shoved the fuck out of me while I'm on the balls of my feet trying to whisper. He knocked me back four steps. I believe I caught him in a deception. What's more is that Eddings says his claim can be backed up by one of two cooperative witnesses, Gearbox co-founder Landon Montgomery. Montgomery corroborates the assault allegation, saying, David leaned up to whisper something to Randy and out of the blue, Randy shoves him hard. Eddings also offered screenshots from a tirade of Snapchat messages he received from Pitchford after the incident, with the CEO having demanded, who the fuck are you loyal to, and jeering that Eddings' priorities are completely fucked. Yeah, you know that bit in the final Borderlands 2 DLC where Claptrap, with a new voice actor, begs Lilith for his job back? I guess I'll have to go beg Lilith for my old job back. Oh, Lilith! Mighty ruler of the Crimson Raiders, I beseech you to please, please let me have my old job back. I'm sorry I abandoned you in your time of need. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, your mercifulness. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Puts that in a whole new light, doesn't it? But hey, you know what? This is all, it's all just okay. It's all fine. After all, Randy Pitchford's a little autistic. He's a little on the spectrum. So we have to forgive him or that's ableist, right? Right, guys? You can do whatever you want nowadays. Peacock parties, physical assaults, potentially child porn, losing private documents at a restaurant, embezzling funds, stealing money from your employees, stealing money from your partners, intentionally delaying and tanking a game in order to make way for your pet project, ripping off the only unique thing your pet project has from somebody vastly more talented than you, loading up paying customers' computers with malware designed to monitor your usage, and keylog everything you do, and sell it all off to the Epic Store to their Chinese state corporate overlords, and physically intimidate anyone who finds out about any of your rotten little schemes. It's all fine if you're a little autistic. Randy just doesn't know any better, you bigot. Let's go all the way back to that initial post. The one that was probably fake because the promised leak of Borderlands 3 never actually came out. Despite that, a lot of the stuff in it ultimately lined up, didn't it? Randy Pitchford is confirmed by multiple people to be a control freak and a bully. Multiple sources and stories show him to be exploiting his employees and shuffling money around in an attempt to line his own pockets. 
There's a chance he might even be a sexual abuser, too. And Borderlands 3, now that it's out, pales in comparison to Borderlands 2 in nearly every way. I will never buy a game from these people again. I will never recommend that people buy a game from these people again. If I ever want to play Borderlands 3, or any other game made by this company, I will pirate it. If I ever want to stream it, I'll still pirate it. I am done with just putting up with all of these shitty people ruining the great passion, the one hobby, the community we've all shared for most of our lives now. Fuck them. I've got more videos kind of like this one in the works. EA, maybe? Blizzard? Bethesda? I don't know. We'll see. But hey, if you're watching the premiere of this video, I'll be over on my Twitch channel right now playing a game made by a company that I think is probably one of the last ones out there that doesn't shit the bed this badly. It's the Link's Awakening remake on the Nintendo Switch. Naomi and I are having a great time with it, so drop by twitch.tv slash gameboomers and say hi. And if you're not watching this video on release day, that's okay, because I stream most nights on that Twitch anyway, so come give it a look. I'll see you there. I love you.